All right, so a little introduction. I don't want him to have to introduce himself. Uh, Mark in at Pan House is the founder of Surf Flex Lab. He's a professor of material science at the University of Wollongong. With more than 20 years experience in research, university administration, editing, publishing, and reviewing, his research is focused on the development of new materials, additive manufacturing, including 3D and 4D printing, soft robotics, living and edible uh, electronics, and surfing, including 3D printing and fin or 3D printing fins and surfboards. So that's kind of. Uh, a little bit about Mark, and I'll let him explain the rest of it and what he's been doing. So give it up for Mark. Thank you for being way too kind for, uh, to me. Uh, good evening, everyone. If you look here in this little video, that's our uh, Christmas video. That's not, not just pure destruction of surfboards, but we actually have a log splitter there that has a sensor on it, and then the surfboard is also instrumented so that we can check the load transfer into surfboards and we can test how strong they are. As was mentioned in the introduction, I'm from the University of Wollongong, uh, south of Sydney. I'm based in purpose-built facilities at our innovation campus, where I've set up a lab that is dedicated to the testing of fins and surfboards. So, so we built, for, uh, for a while I've been thinking about how can you best quantify the flex in the surfboard. I'm a surfer myself, probably the worst surfer by a mile in this room, but whenever I would go and buy surfboards, I was given all these options of putting different types of glassing on it and stringers and loose stringers and different carbon fibers, and that led me to think like, how can I really figure out how to test that? So, we build an instrument that we call the flex machine, and you can see it working here where we're testing different types of layups. So this is an EPS foam, where a company has provided us with 15 different types of their material so that we can test, if you put a different layup on a material, how does that impact on the torsional flex of the system? And we've got an instrument here, so we have at the back, we can apply torsion to it. We can also obviously do two-point bending, and we can also send oscillations through these materials. So we can figure out, at least on the lab conditions, when you change something in the fabrication of your surfboard, or even to compare boards that have stringers, no stringers, if you put dampeners in, if you put different types of glassing on it, we can then test these materials. So things we can do in our lab include board Include, for example, if you look at the video on the left, that's going to work. We can check, for example, what is, what is the strength in a leash plug, or how much force do you require to break off a tail in the board. Or if you look at the video in the center, we then do impact testing on boards. And again, we're looking at the transfer of the load from the weight into the surfboard. So we check how much, if you put a load onto a board, how much of that impact then goes into the board. We also look at breaking strength. Here's a board that didn't survive. Now I have to point out, most of the times we don't actually break the boards because if I did that, no manufacturer would ever send me a board. So we do a lot of non-destructive testing. That we do. One of the examples of the non-destructive testing that we do is we check what the damping behavior is in the surfboard. So if a surfer, the analogy in surfing would be, if a surfer puts a vibration through the board or loads the board up in a turn, how long would it take on the laboratory conditions for those vibrations to die out? If you look at that video, you can see a motion enhanced picture of how much the soft top vibrates in comparison to a really stiff board. And it's this type of vibration that we measure in a surfboard. If you look at this on a plot, you literally see, you get this sort of jiggling behavior, and the faster this dies out, the more your surfboard is damping. You can also think of the reverse. If you load this up, if you load the surfboard up, you can also get energy coming back at you because there's a force that is acting on decreasing these 
vibrations. Another term, sometimes we talk about shock observer statistics or damping. And last July, or this July, we also have a field version of this, so I don't have to do everything in the lab. I can come to you, this little suitcase here, as a field version where we can do damping behavior. So for example, we went to Aaron Gold's house in July together with, uh, with David, and we tested some of his jaws guns. If you look at this picture here, so if you remember, what we're looking at a damping is this vibration behavior. So here's a little Parisi shape performer model. It's a 6.3, it's got a 4 on the bottom, and a double 4 on the deck. And you see that undergoes a lot of vibrations. Here at the bottom, plotted on the exact same scale, is one of Aaron's jaws guns. Those boards don't move at all. They are really stiff, they really resist any sort of scattering behavior that we can. And we can put numbers on this. So for example, the short board, we can get a C value. I have a range of values. I'll spare you all the details of the mathematics that lie behind it. But if you look at the normal short board, that has a value of 10. And that's the damping force. So how fast does this die out? If you compare that to the gun, then it's 90. So it dampens a lot faster than a normal short board would do. We can take this a bit further and then start looking at if you make boards where you have different flex in different parts of the board. So this is from a shaper called Jed Doan. He's in Pambola on the New South Wales coast, and he makes what are called flex tails. So you have here, this is a, an EPS board, but at the bottom, it's got a carbon tail linked into it. And again, we can then look at, for example, what does the non-flex tail part of the board do? And you can see there's a lot of dampening in the board. When you go down to the flex tail, and again, this is plotted on the same scale, you see that's a lot more damping in the flex tail part of the board. And again, we can quantify this. We use another number. So in terms of the flex tail, it's got a value of about 10. In parts of the rest of the board, it's got about 2.7. And we can compare that then between different parts of the board. In general, what we find, if you look at this picture here, this is a standard PU board with a stringer in it, and the damping in this board is very similar no matter where you are in this particular board. It's got uniform damping. If you go to the flex tail, it will have significantly different damping in the board in the tail of this board. Another aspect that we can do is we can do what is called fingerprint analysis of board, boards, and it's almost like a quality control. If you look at Brett there, he's tapping the board, and then we get back a whole bunch of frequency and vibration information about a board. The way this works is we have an accelerometer on one part of the board, and then we tap with a very expensive hammer on different other locations on the board. This, again, is also part of our field, and I'll show you what the hammer looks like. I mean, this costs $6,000 in Australia. It doesn't look like it costs $6,000. It usually costs $20, because it doesn't make any difference than a hammer that you can get from the hardware store. But it's instrumented. Crucially, what it allows us to do, it gives off what I call fingerprints of boards. So different types of constructions will have unique characteristics. You don't have to understand the peaks to see that if you take an EPS board and you take a PU board, that they look completely different. If you take a soft top, they look different again. And we're going to use that to also investigate what happens when you start putting different dampeners into your surfboard. So this is a board here. It's an EPS core, and it's got Spintech technology in it. And so it's an EPS core, and it's got this. I'm not exactly sure what is actually in the Spintech. It's some form of a resin and a fiber. But what you can investigate with the tools that we've developed you can then put numbers on this, so we can quantify what the flex is in the board. But we can also look at the fingerprints. And again, you don't have to have understand what the peaks are, but you can very simply see, let's focus on this black peak here, that's the polyurethane board. That's the EPS board without the spine in it. When we then add a spine to it, it changes the entire fingerprint. And these fingerprints are completely repeatable between different boards. Each board has a unique fingerprint. We also think this is a way for quality control of surfboards. And again, we can look at 
the damping behavior. So let's say this PU board, they're all of the same dimensions. It's got a C value of about 10. The EPS, the pure blank, it's got a value of six. When we add the spine tag to it, you get a significant change in the damping behavior. So that's just a little overview of the three things that we can do. And I've got no idea how I'm doing for time. Oh, about 10 minutes. About 10 minutes, I'll, I'm actually gonna finish on time. So one of the things that Dave mentioned in his introduction is that a couple of years ago, we started working on 3D printed fins for surfboard. And again, this came out of a question that somebody asked me. I had a friend who is a school teacher. He brought some kids through our lab and he said, why don't you print me some fins? And I said, okay, I'll take up this challenge. Yeah. So we've done a whole bunch of things. We use computer-aided design, computational fluid dynamics. We do field work. And obviously, I usually show this slide where people aren't surfers of why you actually need fins. You need control, you want hold and drive, and you want maneuverability. Here's Nick Clifford on our field testing in Indonesia uh, earlier last year. So that's an instrument board as well. It's got sensors in the board, and Nick himself is also wearing sensors. So that allows us to also quantify the experience of what he's doing. And then we went and looked at printing 3D printed fins. If you're familiar with 3D printing, actually printing yourself a fin at home is super easy. You go to the web, download one, print it, put it in your board, I guarantee you it will snap. We spent, <laughs> this picture here goes from 2015 with different prototypes that we tested. This is one picture. Actually, we spent two, three years of work on this. We had to go and cycle through different types of printers. This won't Unless you're in the 3D printing business, this won't mean very much, but we use Comixes and Vortices and Dimension U prints. Every time I went to someone that had a printer, I said, I'll send you a file, print me a fin, send it over, I'll test it. So eventually what we ended up with is we use this printer that allow us to put continuous fibers into it. So we can make fins, for example, and you're more welcome to come up afterwards to have a look at it. So these are 3D printed fins. We can do the FCS2 plug or the Futures plug, and they look like normal fins, they feel like normal fins, and we've tuned the material's characteristics for these to look exactly like normal fins. The key in this was it's got a nylon chopped microcarbon fiber composite through which we can lay continuous fiber, and that gives us, gives us the strength. Obviously, we want to put numbers on it, so we developed some rigs in the lab so that we can actually test the flex in the fins. So we do standard engineering things where we measure how much force do I require to put the tip of the fin down. We also do it in this slightly damaged surfboard so we get an indication of what happens in the lab when you put these fins in. And then we can compare different types of fins. We can compare them between different types of stiffnesses. So for example, this is a flex modulus. And then we can compare between carbon fiber, high temperature glass fiber, and just normal fiberglass fins. And then we can go further on and actually quantify it. So we did it for a whole bunch of fins that are on the market from FCS, from Futures, and then we were able to tune our fins to the exact same fit and The other thing we want to test in the lab as well, if you look at this little video at the bottom here, we want to know how good actually you seem to be wearing the same t-shirt, is if you subject your fin to impact, how well do they behave? In this case, bang, that didn't work. That was one of our earlier prototypes. Now if you look at this picture here, we tested a whole bunch of commercial fins. When I saw this, I couldn't believe fins deflect that much and do not break. So this is a three kilogram weight being dropped at about three meters per second. It hits this fin here and you notice that's the fin bending. It deflects by about 20 degrees. I really learned when we were doing these tests how to dodge weights because the fin actually shoots the weight back up. There is very little damage to the fin. In some cases, you get some damage to the glass. I was not aware that fins could deflect by that much. And actually, most of the commercial fins that we've tested do this. So do our fins. It's only when you get these are some cheaper type of fins, but most fins will do these. That was pretty surprising for us. 
So I mentioned before that we like to measure performance in fins as well. And this is a pretty complicated graph, but I'll just talk you through it. So what we do is we design our fins, we print them, we test them in the lab, then we go into the ocean. In the ocean, we put all kinds of sensors on, on the board, and then we also, we look at what is called, we quantify the subjective experience. So the surfer goes out surfing, when they come back in, we ask them, how much hold did you have? How did your legs feel? How fast did you go? Did you have enough drive? Could you turn the fins? And we do this with what is called visual analog scales. And it's just a scale that is non-gradated, and they have to pick at a particular point so that they can't remember when to do the test the next time where they've actually picked. And that allows us to quantify the subjectivity. In the meantime, we have all these different sensors. So we have three types of GPS systems. We also measure you know, what the, uh, the angles are doing of the board. So we look at the rail, the pitch, the yaw. We look at entry speeds, exit speeds. We look at all different types of behaviors. So to summarize what we're doing, we have an instrumented surfer. So here's Brett wearing two different types of GPS systems on an instrumented surfboard where we have these little trace devices that are embedded. And then we go surfing, about five minutes. And then we also do blind testing. So we tried to get into wave pools, but we weren't allowed to go to wave pools. So we went to the next best thing that we thought was available, which is the macaroni's place in Indonesia, if you're surfers, I don't have to explain why we went to this place. Here's a little video showing of how it's running, but in the interest of time, I go on. So what we actually gathered is, and this is Julie Steele from the University of Wollongong who designed all our human trials. So we did six days of testing, we had six surfers, we tested up to eight hours a day, we quantified the subjective experience with 324 questions, we recorded 425 waves, 1,700 turns. The amount of data to analyze is huge, obviously. I did 288 <coughs> fin changes for a couple of months after that. I never took a single fin out of my boards again because I would change the fins so that the surfers couldn't see. And I can't stress that point enough if you ever do testing, is your surfer should not know what they're surfing with. If they do that, they get influenced. If I put a 3D printed fin at my surfboard, I think I'm killing it. And that's because I know I have the fin in it, so I think I'm gonna go better. Anyway, so in terms of data analysis, we got all this data coming at us. So what we did is, we developed a cloud-based processing for this, so that I can upload the, the, the sensor data to the cloud, and then I have a number of visualization tools, so that I don't have to continuously download to my computer, open up the spreadsheet to make the files, but I can just go and click buttons. So as an example, so we can do, I already mentioned average speed, entry speed, exit speed, rotational speed, and I can also look at power scales between different types of surfers over different waves. So it's a visualization tool that we can use. The other thing where data then comes in, which we can actually measure, and I apologize if this gets technical, but when you do a bottom turn, you're Really, if you continue your bottom turn, you're gonna rotate in a particular direction. If you come out of your bottom turn, like Dylan Parisi is doing here, and you go into a cutback, you change the direction of your rotation. If you change your direction, so you go from anti-clockwise to a clockwise direction, that change, you can calculate what the power is coming out of a turn. So it gives us a way of calculating power out of terms, and I'm probably going to run out of time. But what we can do with this, we can then figure out using data analytics to show if we have someone surfing on commercial fins, this is their power, their speed, their angles, their rotational velocity, their change in direction, and we can compare it if they go to 3D printed fins. And what we can show is that the surfer performs similarly, whether they were using commercial fins or 3D printed fins. So we can use data analytics as a statistical tool. I'm not going to talk about CFD, because that's what Luca is going to speak about, but what I did want to show is that when you do CFD, you can make predictions about how your fins are going to behave. So in our case, we made these fins that have serrated edges and that have these grooves in it. CFD tells us that we should be able to get generated speed out of this. When we actually did these measurements, we found that out of the subjective experience, 
the majority of our surfers said, yes, we were going fast and we could generate more speed on these fins. Thankfully, the measured data said exactly the same. We're still analyzing a lot of the other data, but that sort of ties in with the CAD. And I'm going to leave you with one last slide because I'm probably out of, out of time. What I really dream about is to have what is called the instrumented wave, where you have a wave pool that is instrumented, so you can dial up the power. You also have a confinement confined in a controlled location, and you can put an instrumented surfer on an instrumented surfboard in there so that you can get data back. You can then also video the waves. You can get judges to score the waves, and then you can use machine learning to link data to subjectivity to scores so that you can make a tool for training surfers, improving the surfers in this combined environment, but also to optimize your equipment. So it could also be a tool for shapers. Hey, anyway, that's probably still a bit in the future. I hope what I've shown you today in this brief presentation is that we have the tools for quantifying the behavior, not just the surfboards and the fins, but also the info data infrastructure to handle the statistics. And ideally, I'd like to get to where it's in the way this. Obviously, this is not the work of just me. There's a whole bunch of people involved. In particular, I'd like to thank Luca and Dave, because we're doing this together. Um, some financing, and I usually end my talk on thanking Jimi Hendrix for his music, <laughs> and the Irons for surfing, and you for listening. I'm happy to answer questions. And that's it. Stop, so I'm done. I would like to ask if there are any questions for, for Mark, for Mark's talk. Probably, or you have even better tool here in what's called Luca. So Luca can simulate the wave that we're riding. And we were just talking about things where what we really like to know is what is the translation of power from a surfer into the surfboard and then back on again. How do surfers harness power? In surfboards, how can you use them? What effect does the wave have? CFD has the capability to do that. We've been trying to develop these sensors that surfers will wear. And the ocean is such a, I can't think of the proper nice word now, it's not a very good environment to be in. So the ocean destroys our sensors. But there are people working on this. In the lab conditions, there's a lady at the university that, that looks at aerial lab and she does it in the lab. Thank mm -hmm. you.